I'm Pam Walker. I'm a member of Central Vermont Refugee Action Committee. And bienvenidos, welcome to everyone. We, we had no idea we'd have so many people here tonight. But we do have plenty of cookies and cider and soda water for everybody. So this event uh, we feel is very special. It's sponsored by CB, CB RAN, Central Vermont Refugee Action Network, as well as the UU Church of Montpelier, where you are, where you're now sitting. And I think we're in for a very special evening because we have five speakers who are going to share their experience of what, what it was like from different perspectives. And I'll tell you more shortly. And the, uh, their stories I know are going to be heartwarming, heartwarming and, and uh, intriguing and inspiring. So I think we are going to have quite a time tonight. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit more about uh, Central Vermont Refugee Action Committee. We started about, in 2015, a small group of people, and uh, small and active, and we worked to provide support to refugees, migrants, and immigrants uh, all over the state of Vermont, and we do it in various ways. Uh, we try to connect new Vermonters, as they're now called, instead of refugees, try to, we try to call them the new kind of language would be New Vermonters. And we offer public presentations like this to raise our awareness about what's going on with, with immigrants and refugees and, and migrants. And um, we do legislative advocacy, language tutoring, conversation partners. We have a fr new friendship group. Um, we provide educational materials with our money, camp scholarships to children of uh, new Americans, we can't afford it, and welcome gifts to new arrivals. We also have a day of hospitality where we invite new um, arrivals to come to the State House and the History Museum and to join us for a meal. And we do that oh, about five times a year whenever we've got the energy and the money. And it's really exciting. We really enjoy that a lot. So that's all about CB RAN. Our speakers are going to be, uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce them a little bit more later, but uh, Reverend Joan Duval, Javier Duval, who's the minister of our church, and she's going to be talking about her experience traveling to Honduras, where she worked, um, she went with a, she'll tell you all about it, but she went with a pilgrimage to really discover the root causes of migration for the Hondurans. Why are so many Hondurans now starting to flee across the border? And then we have three women who gave a lot of their time and energy and went to El Paso for two weeks and they volunteered at Annunciation House, which provides support to people coming across the border, passing through detention and seeking asylum. And you're gonna hear about their experiences together in a few minutes. Um, and most importantly and lastly, we're gonna be hearing from a uh, Mexican, recent Mexican migrant. He's, uh, his name is Beto Sanchez, he's over here. And Will Lambeck is doing simultaneous translating. So if you hear mumbling going on over here, that's Will. Uh, Will Lambeck is a uh, champion of human rights for migrants and a very hardworking organizer for migrant justice. And you'll hear more about them in a minute. Okay, what else did I have to say first? Uh, Orca, it will be here filming, and you'll see Jerome in the back. So uh, if you want to see this again, or you will have friends who missed it, uh, it will be on Orca at some point. Right, Jerome? Yes. At some point. Soon. Uh, bathrooms, through this door, there's one in that room over there, and there's one to my left, and then uh, one right in the back of this room. So just a quick overview of what every, we all pretty much know about what's going on at the border in terms of the pressure of, for migration. I'm sorry, I've got to find the right page here. So we know the situation is dire. Uh, people are just flowing over the border for good, good reasons. We think good reasons. The Trump administration says no. They're just, you know, it's, it's not important for them. Um, some facts I learned from the Pew Research Center in the last couple of days, thanks to Abby. Border Patrol agents apprehended 92,000 migrants 
in March alone at the border. That's the highest monthly total in 12 years. <coughs> there were 361,000 apprehensions from this past October until March. 361,000. And Trump has just started to talk about shutting down the border. We've all heard about that, right? And cutting off aid to the, the Northern Triangle countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, and, and Honduras. Luckily, his uh, threat to do that has not materialized. Families are now the majority of apprehensions, and this is very new. It's a big shift from the recent past when the arrests were generally for adults. And we all know that um, the, uh, it's really strained, put a strain on federal authorities. The number of Border Patrol agents at the border, it's fallen since 2013, believe it or not. But there still are 16,608 at last, at last count, not including the Department of Defense mission sending National Guard, uh, 4,000 National Guard troops. So let's hear from our speakers. So I'm going to introduce Joan Duvall, Joan Javier Duvall to you first. She began her ministry here at the UU Church of Montpelier in August of 2015. She comes from Chicago and she's the daughter of immigrants from the Philippines. She is, uh, has a strong dedication to social justice and economic justice, anti-racism, anti-oppression, and she's been a longtime community activist and political organizer. For those of us who've been to marches and protests on the Capitol steps, you've heard Joan speak before. So we welcome Reverend Joan. Thanks, Reverend Joan. Thanks so much, Pam, and the whole CV RAN team for putting this event together, and to all of you for dedicating your evening to being here. Um, I'm going to flip my own slides. So as Pam mentioned, I had the privilege <coughs> and opportunity to participate in an interfaith pilgrimage to Honduras in mid-March, which was about a week long, March 18th to 25th. The pilgrimage was sponsored by four different organizations based in the United States. Share El Salvador, which for decades has been um, sponsoring pilgrimages primarily to El Salvador and more recently to Honduras. They're based in California. The Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, also based in California, Berkeley. The Sisters of Mercy and the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. So these were the four organizations who put the whole trip together. But I was invited to participate by the, our Unitarian Universalist College of Social Justice, which also does its own immersion learning programs, and had in December done a week-long trip to Honduras as well. And so has started to build a relationship with um, local organizations and people, and wanted um, our UU religious leaders to be represented. So I was one of two clergy and four other lay people Unitarian Universalists who went on this trip. Locally in, in Honduras, we were hosted by an organization called Radio Progreso and ERIC, which stands for Equipo de Reflexión, Investigación y Comunicación, Team of Reflection, Investigation, and Communication. They're based in Progreso, which is outside of San Pedro Sula, some of you who might be familiar with the geography of Honduras in the northwestern part of the country. And this is, this is our delegation pictured here, standing outside of the offices of Radio Progreso. Um, about 70 people were on this trip from all around the country, as well as uh, two nuns who were from, um, one is from Argentina and Chile, and the other from Peru. So they joined our group, but otherwise we're mostly from the US and consisted of people of faith, but also community leaders and activists doing immigrant rights work in their local communities, many from California, but also from other parts of the country, including myself from Vermont. And I'll just say that uh, Radio Progreso is, um, some of you, I was on um, WGDR yesterday talking with Joseph Gainza and mentioned them. This is a community-run uh, radio station in Progreso, 
which it really stays connected to the community and grassroots journalism um, and has just been providing really life-saving journalism um, there in Honduras. So they're based in Progreso, but they have volunteers all around the country who are journalists covering what's happening um, politically and, and economically. And they also do a lot of community organizing and social services as well as research into human rights abuses and all sorts of other issues. So they're really just an uh, incredibly dynamic organization. The leader, the head, the director of the organization is a Jesuit priest, Father Ismael Moreno, um, affectionately known as Padre Melo. So I might refer to him as Padre Melo throughout this um, presentation. So why did, we, why did we go on this pilgrimage? As uh, Pam already set some of the context in terms of the Central American migrant caravans that um, have been growing over the last year or more. Um, and so this, the group of um, organizations that put on this pilgrimage have, have done previous trips to Honduras with this question of what really are the root causes of migration in mind and this trip was kind of a follow-up. Um, and initially, when they first did their, their first trip, maybe two years ago, you know, the organizers sort of had in mind, oh right, what are the root causes of migration? Gang violence and poverty, right? We hear that over and over again. And on one of their delegations, they started to hear more and more about the real interlocking and interconnected systems and uh, political and economic <coughs> as well as the long history that has been driving people out of the country over a long period of time, and also about some of the more recent conditions with which I will get into. So this is, this is a photo um, from the AP of Central American migrants um, going tra traveling through the Mexican state of Chiapas um, to just give a visual of the thousands of migrants who are making this, making this journey. Pam mentioned this as well, that Honduras is part of the Northern Triangle of Central America, Gua Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, being those bordering countries. And this is just a close-up of Honduras. Um, if you can see, the capital of Tegucigalpa is sort of towards the bottom part of the country, borders the Caribbean Sea, the Atlantic Ocean there. Um, we and our our pilgrimage started in San Pedro Sula, which is in kind of the northwestern part of the country. But we had we were such a large group that we broke into three different subgroups, smaller groups, who two of whom traveled to different parts of the country. So uh, one group went northward towards what it's not labeled on this map, but it's called Bajo Bajo Aguan, um, which is on as a coastal um, indigenous coastal community. And I was part of a group that went kind of a little bit southwest of San Pedro Sula into a region called the Santa Barbara region. And then what the, the last group stayed in San Pedro Sula. So I will, I will speak very much to my experience um, traveling to the Santa Barbara region. Um, and there were lots of other things that the delegation learned about um, in the other parts of the trip. Um, which I will not be able to speak to as well, um, but I'll, I'll mention some of the other things that they learned. So this is just a photo of our whole delegation inside the offices of Radio Progreso <laughs> being oriented, given, given some context about the country of Honduras by Padre Melo, who is um, standing to the left with his back to us. Um, they had set out this beautiful mandala uh, on the floor to describe the work that they do with Radio Progresso Eric. Um, and I, I don't have time to go into all the details of that, but that's, that's what that is pictured there. So a little context on Honduras. Um, it is just land-wise, it's about a little more than 43,000 square miles, and just for comparison, Vermont is just under 10,000 square miles, so, I don't know, just four and a half, is my math correct? Four and a half times the size of Vermont, not that big, a 
population of about 9 million, um, although 7 million in the country, 2 million outside of the country. And the, the question that Padre Melo put to us as he gave us his orientation to the country was, a cual país viene? To what country are you coming? And on the one hand, you know, he outlined some really positive and wonderful um, <coughs> things about the country, that it's rich in biodiversity, right? It's a, it's a country that just is, uh, has fertile land and rivers and um, forests and, you know, we have All Species Day coming up, right? All kinds of species throughout the country, so beautiful in that way. It's a majority mestizo population, meaning Spanish and indigenous. There are nine indigenous communities um, throughout Honduras. And that there has been a long history of both internal and regional migration. So migration on its own is not a big deal. It happens, it has happened all the time within the country, with other Central American countries. El Progreso, the, the town that we were in, that Radio Progreso was in, is 50% people from El Salvador, right? So it's not unusual for migration to happen. Um, and these are just some photos. This is um, a photo of a road in um, La Presa, which I'll talk about this community later, just giving some glimpses of the beautiful country it is. This is um, some school children who were teaching us um, La Sopa de Carical, it's a dance, <laughs> Honduran dance. Um, so on the trip we just, you know, we're surrounded by song and dance and mucha, mucha alegría, a lot of joy. They invite, a lot of hospitality, they in invited us to join in, right? <laughs> La Sopa de Carical. But a cual país viene? To what country have we come? Honduras is also one of the poorest countries in Latin America. Three million people unemployed of seven million who are in the country. Highest income inequality in all of Latin America. Um, with about 150 families who own 96% of the wealth of the country. So incredibly concentrated wealth with the, in very few hands. It has one of the highest murder rates in the world. And, and the interlocking oppressions of class, race, and gender affecting so many women in this um, just dire situation around femicide, right? women especially being targeted and victim of, victims of sexual violence and assassination. So in the words of Father Melo, who is just so incredibly articulate, this is him, he just, he laid it out for us, right? Here's his truth telling. It is the alliances between oligarchic business and political elites and transnational capital backed by the US Embassy, the armed forces, and people from organized crime that create the caravan. Um, and I'll just say, I mean, the one of the things I was really, um, take, took away from the trip and that um, will stay with me is the incredible incredibly, incredibly sharp analysis that people have on the ground. People know why this is happening, um, and and we need to, we, you, based in the U.S., right, need to do more to educate ourselves on how this all works and what our role has been as a, as a country. So roots of migration, I talked a bit um, already about poverty. Just going to see if there are any other um, data points I want to mention. 68% um, of Hondurans live in poverty, 44% in extreme poverty. And of those who actually who are able to earn money, to earn some kind of wage, 75% of them receive less than a subsistence wage, or less than what you could just pay for the basics. Um, you know, I, I should also say that, of course, the United States has a long history of intervention in Honduras as well as other Central American countries, which I'm not going to go into that long, long history. I'm going to assume that at least some of you know some of that history, and if you don't, I encourage you to learn more about it. Um, I will say in, in more recent history, Another uh, root cause of migration has been political crisis. In 2009, there was a military coup and um, ousting of um, President 
um, Manuel Z Zelaya in 2009, which was supported by our US State Department. Um, and uh, it was after Manuel Zelaya had begun some economic reforms that he was thrown out. And then in 2017, so just very recently, and this has a lot to do with why the surge, why so many people in the last couple of years, there was a fraudulent, fraudulent election which, in which um, Juan Orlando Hernandez was re-elected as president, although the Honduran constitution says that there's only one term possible for president. And he was supported by their Supreme Court. And so since then, there has been ongoing protest against um, uh, President Hernandez um, and continued political repression. And finally, um, violence with impunity. So people who are defending the land and human rights are increasingly criminalized. They face um, you know, violence from the military, paramilitary, police. There's just, there's just no rule of law happening um, in the country. And there's increasing organized crime, um, but also organized crime is being used as sort of a scapegoat for security forces entering communities um, and, and sort of a ruse, right, for increased security that is actually being used to crack down on um, human rights activists. And of course, we do hear a lot about the violence that's created by gangs and, um, and the extortion, you know, people having to be threatened and if you don't pay us you know, $2,000 by Friday, we're gonna kill your family kinds of things. So that is definitely also happening um, without really any kind of um, <coughs> law and order. So this, I just wanted to highlight, some of you might be familiar with Bertha Cáceres, I'm wearing the uh, Justicia para Bertha t-shirt today, um, who was uh, an environmental activist, indigenous leader, um, who was, you know, recipient of the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2015, gave a beautiful speech, and a year later was assassinated in her home. Um, and, and since then, human rights abuses have, have continued under this um, current, what really folks refer to as a dictatorship. And let, you know, that's a really well-known international case. Um, this is a photo of a journalist from Radio Progreso who, whose life um, has been threatened for the work that he's been doing in the Bajo Aguan region, which I mentioned. And so he's had to leave Bajo Aguan um, and and is seeking right now ways to get out of the country because his life is under threat. Um, and he traveled with us um, uh, to Santa Barbara, so I got to uh, chat with him a little bit. So the final set just of, you know, what is really leading to people fleeing now to forced migration. Um, the, the causes that, that I got to see more up close and, and personal in the travel I did was a forced displacement combined with militarization. And so what that means is that because of the economic model that's really been used in Honduras of um, really exploitive, um, uh, an exploitative economic model that's all about extracting commodities, right, and sending money away for, to foreign owned companies and leaving very little behind, this pushes people off their land. So whether it's agribusness, which you know people might know, Honduras used to be called the banana, original banana republic, right? So it's not bananas anymore, it's sugar cane and palm oil. Um, mining, so mining of gold, um, and you know other precious metals. Um, hydroelectric projects are really um, big and Basically, the government you know, gives land away to foreign-owned companies, and they come in and just kick, you know, kick people off of their land. And this is one of the things that Berta Cáceres was fighting against in her community. There's also tourism and real estate development. So all of this being, you know, multinational, foreign multinational corporations who are coming in see an opportunity, quote unquote, right, to um, to to make money off of the beauty and the resources of Honduras, but not leaving anything for the people. And then when people are 
organizing to try to defend their own rights, um, they're being targeted by the military and paramilitary security forces. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, some of the very uh, specific communities and people that, that I got to meet. That was a little bit of an overview. Maybe someone can give me a time check. Um, so, the first place we went to was a community of La Presa. Um, this is the bridge that we had to cross, <laughs> to cross the Tapalapa River to get to La Presa. You can kind of see in the distance there, the community who had been waiting for us for like three hours. Um, not, I, don't, I think just because they were so excited, we weren't that late, um, to, to meet with us to tell us all about, all about La Presa. This is them. Um, so in, in La Presa, um, your folks have been, or, have been organizing for over a decade to resist a hydroelectric dam project. There are about 82 families that live in La Presa. Every family in La Presa has at least one family member who has migrated to the US. Um, only 20 families live in houses made of concrete. This is one of those houses. Everyone else lives in houses made of adobe or dirt or wood. I stayed in this house that's, that's pictured here one night um, with a family who were very well off compared to everyone else because they did actually have an indoor toilet um, and they were able to have one television in the house. So they actually had electricity and a toilet. Um, and what I want to say about them. Um, and this is the river up close, the Tapalapa. The one that I said recently in my, ser my Easter sermon reminded me of rivers in Vermont. Besides all the trees, which are different, the, the rocks and the river. Um, Tapalapa means abundance from underground. We met um, people in the community of La Chinda, um, who are similarly, this is the Ulua River, similarly are resisting um, hydroelectric dam projects in their community. Um, and Be Betty Vasquez is pictured in the top left, who is similar to, to Berta Cáceres, uh, a feminist and an environmentalist. Um, and again, this community, you know, they have such um, an incredible analysis of what's going on and really understand that the, the economic model that's being propagated has led to a lot of the problems. Um, and when we ask this community, what message do you want us to bring back? to the United States, they said, um, stop sending military aid to Honduras. <coughs> um, this is again another photo of some um, human rights and land defenders um, pictured here in the, in the very front with our delegation. Um, and I just want to say, you know, I think maybe people, some people, since I've returned, have asked, like, gosh, it seems so dire, or what, what are people doing? And I just want to say, you know, la lucha sigue, sigue. People are, the struggle continues, and people are um, just incredibly persistent and, um, and filled with a fire to, to keep on making, um, to resist the forces that are at work in Honduras um, and are looking for solidarity. I mean, we got at that in La Chinda when, when people were sort of suspicious of us <laughs> and said, why are you here? And we said, we're here to be in solidarity with you. We were greeted with applause, like rousing applause. Her sign says, el agua no se vende, se cuida y se defiende, no al extractivismo. The water is not to be sold, um, it's to be cared for and defended, no to extractivism. Um, this young man's sign says, ni una muerta más, um, not one more dead. Um, and I'm sorry, I know I'm going over my time. So uh, the last thing I want to say is about the um, continuing movement um, against the current presidency, which, which Hondurans many refer to as a dictatorship. Um, people have been trying to reclaim the streets. Um, and there's currently, I mean, just this week, there were political protests in which people were tear gassed. Um, and 
I, you know, from what I can tell from local news assassinations happening. Um, and one of the important things we did as a delegation was to um, accompany people on a, to, in this vigil calling for the freedom of political prisoners um, and use our, um, use our bodies, our uh, U.S. passport protected bodies to offer some safety to people as they gathered in front of the U.S. Embassy. Um, so that's where, that's where we are in this photo. Um, and we are also asked to tell the truth. So this is us meeting. There's no ambassador to Honduras right now. There's a Shard de Fair, Heidi Fulton. This is our delegation meeting with Heidi Fulton um, and the human rights officer, accompanied by two people from Bajo Oguan who had been um, jailed and then released um, to share some of our truth and stories from our visit. Um, you can, I'll, I can talk to you later about um, the Berta Cáceres Human Rights in Honduras Act. This is something that's currently been introduced to the U.S. Congress, um, which would suspend U.S. military and police aid. So this is one kind of aid that it would, people would be glad to have stop to Honduras. So there's been a lot of con you know, conversation about aid. Military and police aid would be great if, if we were not contributing in that way to Honduras. Peter, Congressman Peter Welch is a co-sponsor of this, in case anyone's wondering. Um, but it would be great to continue to encourage, um, encourage him and his staff and others to support that. Um, so I'll just wrap up by saying if you want to learn more and support the work, there's a table over there where you can sign up for email alerts um, through the UU Service Committee or Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity and also to make a donation. We're hoping to organize a speaking tour to bring Hondurans to the US to share their experiences. So you can make a donation, you could buy a t-shirt, which is also going to the organization, and um, you can find out more at the table. So thank you all. Thanks so much, Joan. That was just really amazing. And the, for our first speaker, so everybody's trying to do the impossible, by the way, which is um, we have three uh, very intrepid volunteers that are going to try to talk in 20 minutes about their experience on the border in El Paso. And first of all is Abby Callahan, retired teacher from Montpelier. She regularly volunteers for the community lunch, and she's so eager to share what she's got to say here. Um, she spent the two, two weeks in El Paso with the Annunciation House. Thank you. Um, I'm starting with a map. Um, I want you to notice how far Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador are. They're, um, Guatemala is 2,000 miles away from El Paso. So El Salvador and Honduras are even that much further. <coughs> Long journeys for these people. Another map that shows um, many of the cities involved in the, or in the news, you'll notice that every city has a sister city across the border. There is so much um, just economic activity that goes from El Paso to Juarez and that goes from Laredo to Nuevo Laredo every day. So when Trump talks about shutting down the border, he's um, really um, saying something that just can't happen because it would be an economic um, calamity. Every day in El Paso, 23,000 pedestrians cross. 21 million cars cross annually. Um, El Paso is the safest city along um, the U.S. Mexico border, and it has um, 600,000 plus people, almost the same number of, or about the same number of people as um, all of Vermont. Now Sally's gonna, we're gonna sort of jump up and down. We're gonna take turns. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sally DeSico. I live here in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. uh, I went down with these two friends to El Paso, and I stayed the, uh, almost three weeks. Um, here are some beautiful faces. 
that we wanted to share with you. My little piece is going to be about what happens to the migrants when they reach the border. When they're on American soil, they have the right to request asylum. And they turn themselves in, and they're put in detention centers, which we didn't enter. We, we were not allowed to go into the, any of the detention centers. Usually, from what we've heard, the people we met, were, they were in detention for three to five days, and then released to Annunciation House. So um, I brought this Mylar blanket in case you wanna feel it afterwards. This is what they're given. A Mylar blanket, a space on the floor, cold sandwiches, it's crowded, it's noisy. Uh, many of our friends told us they got yelled at. The lights are kept on all night long. They, Air conditioning is turned up very high. The migrants call it the ice box. You've probably heard about this, some of you in the news. They remove their shoelaces, their belts, and they are released with a shackle on their ankle. I call it a shackle. It's a ankle bracelet that has a a box on it that has their UPS, uh, uh, yeah. no, what do you call it? GPS of where they're going. <laughs> um, oh, let me let me advance these slides. I'm, here I am yakking away. This, I don't know, I haven't got this slide. It's awesome. It really shows what it's like. And um, I think it was mentioned already that um, uh, there are they are families. We saw families: uh, a mom and a and a child, or a dad and a child. Usually two, two by two. They came. Um, and is that is that is, yeah? So you need to hear about Annunciation House because it's an incredible place. Good. Doesn't look like much. <laughs> this is Annunciation House, started in 1976 by a group moved by the gospel to live with the poor, as Christ had. When working with the poor, the initial volunteers realized that the most underserved were the undocumented, as they weren't eligible for any other services um, in the city of El Paso. They were the neediest and the poorest. And so that was, has been where their focus has been. Um, this is the inside of that, other, of, of that building we just saw. Um, in, Annunciation House has several buildings in El Paso. In each one, um, the volunteers live, the long-term volunteers, there are supplies that come from all over El Paso and Texas and the country. Um, and the rooms are just full of such supplies and um, Joe will talk about them later. This is another one of the, El um, one of the Annunciation houses. And this is where, and, and you'll notice that on neither house was there any signage at all. I mean, it's just as plain as plain can be. And this one was actually near the bus station. In this particular house, um, we visited it um, as our only day off happened to correspond with Trump's visit to El Paso. And what um, Ruben Garcia did, he's the man in the white hair, was um, he had a press conference and invited you know the press in town, and um, because he wanted to get the message out, not about how the migrants coming in were rapists or drug addicts, but he wanted to show the real face of these families, and the families were interviewed. Um, the man in the dark suit and the striped tie was a um, a migrant. He came through in 1988 from El Salvador and um, after his parents had been assassinated. His parents are actually those pictured 
um, about the rainbow. Um, and um, he is now a tax-paying um, citizen of, um, you know, in very good standing. Oh, I want to talk a little bit more about um, Ruben Garcia. As I said, he's been the director since the beginning, since 1976. And um, he is involved in every part of Annunciation House. He doesn't have a secretary. He doesn't have an assistant. He is the one who drives um, to the fast food chicken place to pick up chicken for 300 to bring to um, each of uh, the, the different, um, let's see, pop-up sites. We were stationed in the La Quinta. There were um, probably uh, five sites where the, the asylum seekers were housed when um, we were in El Paso. We were at one point in Las Cruces, but then we were um, transferred back. As I said, he doesn't have a secretary. Um, the youth group at our church decided to that they wanted to spend some of their money to donate to Annunciation House um, to purchase some bags, and you'll see later on. Um, and I, knowing you know from the website that there were several different addresses, I emailed to find out which address to send the bags to. And I got an email back in 12 hours from Ruben himself. I mean, he has no secretary. Uh, he, he takes people to bus stations. He takes people to the hospital. As I said, he picks up chicken. Um, and he, he just does everything. None of the um, volunteers get paid. Just. Oh, yes, ICE calls him up three or four times a day. Ruben, can you take 100? Ruben, can you take 300? Ruben, I've got a family that needs to go to the hospital. Ruben, you know, I mean, they're, they call him up all the time, and he just says yes, and um, he makes happen what happens. Um, he said there's no faith tradition that isn't categorical about the commitment to the stranger the neglected, the rejected. He's an extremely religious man. This is a calling. And um, he says, you know, since 9-11, the country is, the people in our country are harder, angrier, and less welcoming. But he's made it his mission to welcome those. Hi, I'm Joe. And I also was in El Paso for two weeks with Abby and Sally. So what happens after detention, and Ruben gets that call in the morning, let's say at 11 o'clock, there are volunteers stationed in many, in all of these sites. As um, Abby said, there's like six um, sites that are there all the time. And then they have to open up new sites at La Quinta Inns. And I will always stay at a La Quinta Inn from here on out. Because yeah. even though they just got half paid for their rooms, they were tremendously welcoming yeah. to everyone, not just the volunteers, but mostly to the migrants. And um, so at 11 o'clock, Ruben gets his call from the detention center, and then Ruben starts calling around to see where the spaces are. And if there aren't enough spaces, which in, when we were there, there were not, they open up a new site a temporary site at a La Quinta Inn. <coughs> this is a bus that came, so these buses come through daily, and we get anywhere from 50 to 130 um, migrants arriving for help after they come out of detention a day, just one site, just one site. And uh, so they come out of, this is actually right in front of a La Quinta that we worked at, so they come out of the bus, they're escorted out of the bus, and the United States and, and detention and ICE says goodbye. And then they walk in and think of yourself in a, in a, La, in a hotel La Quinta breakfast area, okay? So 50, this is a bus that had 50 people that day. And they come in and they sit in the tables, they stand up, they sit on the floor, there's not enough space for everyone. And then there's a volunteer in each of these sites and um, has to be Spanish speaking. 
and there are messages and they, and they are welcomed. And at this point, I got really teary-eyed from what I heard from the welcome. And normally, we've been hearing, I don't know why I understand, why I understood what he was saying, but in any event, maybe somebody, because <laughs> they speak in Spanish, so maybe somebody translated it for me. But I got teary-eyed, and this is what they say. So if you want to, I invite you to close your eyes, put yourself in um, the space of a migrant, of a person with a family, with young children, anywhere from pregnancy, infancy, to you know, most of them six, seven, eight year, years old, girls and boys, and then to some teenagers. And they say, welcome. We welcome you here. You are safe here. And this is what they hear for the first time after that 2,000 mile journey. 95 percent, excuse me, and then after detention, where one thing that was not said is is that they told us that did you see that um, that picture with all the um, space blankets that the the people who work in the detention center see them as almost like animals in a, on a farm. It's feeding time, and that's what they call them. It's feeding time. Um, for the numbers, that's what they said. So, so here they arrive and are given, given the message, you are safe here. There is enough food for you here. We have food for you. We have water for you to drink. And we have a place for you to shower, take care of your body. We have medicine here and, we, and you will be warm here. You are welcomed and respected here, and we are so thankful that you are here. And volunteers will do their best to support you on your journey. So at, that, at which point we feed them, and um, someone from the group gets up and says a prayer, a very long prayer to God. And there are many you know, people from different countries, but also different languages. So I don't know who's understanding what. But it's very, it was very wonderful to be in that moment in time with them. Very hopeful, very bright, hopeful people. Maybe because they were just so thankful to reach at least this destination where someone was willing to say, we're glad you're here. Then, they, then after that, it's time for intake. When we first arrived, um, we were supposed to get an orientation. <laughs> There was no orientation, literally within five minutes we walked through the door into this uh, La Quinta site and um, there were, the, the volunteers are many, there are many, many nuns from all over the world who come and do community service, sisters of all sorts of orders and, um, and there are people all over the United States and other countries coming, we were working with people from Ontario and so it's now time to, to provide intake. So they get off the bus, they, they're lined up against a wall, and sometimes this weight, the second week we were there, we got the most in one day, which was 130, that's a lot of people. And by the way, these people are cycling out, within 24 hours, they're gone. So a lot needs to take place. And so you can see the different colors. I would, I would be the... Uh, I would be the room I I served the role as a room assigner, and Abby was the runner. Sally was the clothing, clothing and destination um, bag person, and so uh, I was literally taught. So a, a mother and a father. A, a mother comes in with a let's say a son, and I have to assign a room. So pink is one day. Let's say Monday. Two, blue is the next day and yellow is the third day. And this is the only way we know where people are. Oh my goodness. So you have to assign them. And it's two families to a room, so sometimes it's five people into two double beds. There is no such thing as queen size beds, I guess, for <laughs> Quinta. And so you assign them and you have to make sure that you're putting female with female, male with male, and there's only a certain number of rooms that we have to, to make work, so there's a lot of shuffling around. So they go in and the people, the volunteers who do speak Spanish, are, this, this is all done in bedrooms at the La Quinta. So one bedroom is the, the central office and there's two, there's two sites in that room and 
Um, so I would escort one, one family into one site and then another, and they are now give, doing intake. The, inf the information that they need, um, they fill out these um, slips of paper, which identifies who they are. Without this slip of paper, they're just lost, and we just don't know who they are, <laughs> where they are, and, and, and where they are at La Quinta, and where they're destined to. And it's basically um, getting the names and ages of their children and them. And apparently, I didn't realize this, everyone had a destination. Everyone had somebody in the United States that was going to sponsor them. And they had their name and their phone number. And at that point, they're recording that information. And they immediately, in that moment, get on the phone with the sponsor from all over. There was even someone from Vermont. So one of these families, that, when we were there, came to Vermont. and. Um, one drove down from Maine and picked them up. Many, all of them, and most of them go on planes or go on buses. So this sponsor gets called and says, okay, we're here, please make a reservation on a bus or a plane to get them to you. And do that within the next four hours. Then call us back and tell us what the plane flight number is in the day and time. So a lot is happening during this time. Um, the migrant actually talks on the phone and says, you know, we're here, and thank you very much, just so they're, they're, they understand that this is really happening. So then, there's, I assign them a room, a room number, and then, after I assign them a room number, uh, they're given a toothpaste and a toothbrush, and I think that's it, and soap and shampoo, if we have it, and then in baggies, so that's one thing that we do, we prepare those bags, beforehand and have them ready for them. And then um, I asked them in English to wait for Abby so she can run, so she can go to the room and show them their room. So Abby is called the runner. So when they move from here, I must have said the word espera a million times. Espera, I'm still not saying it right. I don't speak Spanish. And so, so they have to wait for Abby. And so and then Abby comes, takes them to the room number, and teaches them how to open up the door, how to um, use the water, how to use the toilet, and to make sure that they not put uh, the toilet paper um, in, a, in the basket or the garbage, so that they can flush it down the toilet, how to do the showers, make sure you're downstairs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner at these times. And so then they leave. And then Abby leaves, comes back, and there's like five more families for her to <laughs> scuttle around. And I think we walked like four miles a day just, just being there. And we need to go fast. Okay. So then, and this is the medicine room. And uh, so there's, there's a medicine room, there's a clothing room. There's the clothing. They come in and everybody gets one pair of a new underwear, a, a new pair of underwear and a new pair of socks. And, and shoelaces. And shoelaces, if they need it. And then there, the, med the medicine room is there are, there are families there with mumps and scabies, scabies and, and, and colds and lots of you know, lip problems. And, and, at one, and there isn't any medical person there, except one of these, the nuns usually is a nurse. But one day there was nobody there who knew anything about medicine. And we called central office and I said, we just don't have a volunteer for it. So we, we're providing medicine. Okay, and what else? And these are volunteers. Um, oh, so then anyway, so then you take that slip of paper and you put it on another board all over the room and it says departures today and departures tomorrow. These two boards. And then on one side of today is who's going away by plane and who's going away by bus date, time, and place. There are thousands of volunteers. Where? Who? Thousands? Yeah. Thousands? Yeah. All right, hundreds. Tens. <laughs> no, I would say hundreds of volunteers. Everything from providing food, oh, oh, all the oh, churches, yeah. Yeah. the Rotary Clubs, sure. Church of the Latter-day Saints, Catholic churches, Protestant churches, oh. Unitarian churches. Um, families who just come together as a family and provide food for 100, 200 people at a time. And, um, and then there's people who actually do this transportation. So you gotta get people who have cars, big cars, to carry many, many people to buses. 
And it's almost like half of them that arrive are gone by the next morning. And that's a lot of transporting. Not to mention that these people don't even know, they don't speak English. They, don't, they have to make you know, buses and things like, um, many buses. And then there is a, um, there, a room with supplies. And a lot of what the volunteers do and what we did was actually prepare these destination bags and in it, you know, um, three sandwich, if, if, if per person, three sandwiches a day, three peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, or maybe ham and cheese sandwiches that a church might offer. You never know. By the way, everything just shows up. It's a miracle. <laughs> there weren't enough bags, so we had our own money, went to a dollar store, and bought 100 bags. And then they take these bags with a bottle of water for each person and some sandwiches and um, some granola bars, and they are literally driven away. You say goodbye. And then, like I said, that happens. There you go, what else? So then we have, um, these are volunteers. And, and there is a, a volunteer who's supposed to be in charge of every shelter building in La Quinta, let's say. And, um, and they're wonderful. And these are nurses, these are three nurses. They, I mean, three nuns. They were just wonderful, and two of them were like in their 90s, and literally our days were like 11 hour days. And when it was time for us to actually go to sleep, we said, we're going, we're leaving, because it could have gone on forever, and the need. And um, as Abby said, um, and I have to agree, I never felt more needed in my life. And then it was, and then you're gonna talk about, and then we're gonna talk about uh, what it's like when they're on their way home. Um, I didn't go to um, the bus station um, with any of the travelers, but um, Joe and I, I mean, I did spend a, um, a morning helping them get through security and then get on planes. And then a few days later, um, Joe and I actually were on our own plane um, back home and we first went to um, Chicago and lo and behold there were um, we got them through security and there were 10 families on our plane so um, <laughs> we got to wait with them and um, one thing that you'll notice here is just the happy faces and if you remember back to one of the first pictures where the border patrol agent was there with the kid looking up like this. Um, here, the people know that they're on their journey, journey and they're very, very excited. Um, this is one picture I didn't take. Uh, we were um, sort of encouraged not to take um, pictures. Um, and this I found on, on a Facebook site, and I'm very sorry I don't um, know the person who took this picture. But the reason I want to show it to you is the father and daughter reminded me very much of a father and daughter who were actually the first people who I took to a room when we were in Las Cruces. And the daughter was about the same age. Um, she had a um, genetic disease called ichosis, I think. It, um, she had, ex um, not this girl, but she had extremely dry scalp, extremely dry skin. Her fingernails were all cracking. Her eyelids were all red. Um, but we learned that her name was Milagros, and Milagros means miracle. And it was just a miracle that they had arrived, and it, the joy that we had in meeting them was miraculous. And you know, it was a, a joy that we experienced um, for the next two weeks. But just. Um, you know, as I got to know this family over, you know, the, tw the 24 or 36 hours that they were with us, um, you know, I, I, um, I said earlier when I spoke, you get to know these families. You, you meet them at the door. You, um, you know, serve them lunch. You serve them dinner. You give them clothing at the clothing room. You, um, you know, give them medicine. You see them five or six or seven times in 24 hours, and you just really feel that you know them. Um, their smiles, their warm gratitude, um, their just thankfulness, um, their, um, I don't know, their hope. And it just, um, 
it, it comes back to you and you know all these wonderful feelings and um, so uh, there were miracles coming to us every day and I really felt them with Milagros and all of a sudden the word miracle started coming into our vocabulary and Sally and I started seeing miracles everywhere and she's going to tell you about some of them. There were so many. <laughs> but I want to tell you one particular one that happened at the very beginning of our journey. Uh, we were in the lobby with some migrants waiting for transportation to the bus. And there was one woman there who was going to a cold city, maybe New York, I can't remember. Um, so we were talking with her. And we were at a La Quinta Hotel, so there were guests at the hotel, you know, regular, normal hotel guests. And um, this woman was checking out, this, this guest at the hotel, she was checking out, and she looked over at this migrant woman, and she said, I don't need this. And she took her coat off, her beautiful black coat, and gave it to this woman, and it fit her perfectly. So that was just one small example, and it still makes me cry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's Let's fine. give a hand to these amazing volunteers. Amazing stories. Amazing stories. Now we're going to hear from Justicia Migrante or the migrant justice folks, and um, I think we probably have two translators. But let me just say a, a little bit more about Abeto. Abeto Sanchez, and he's a farm worker, I think I might have said in Addison County, and from Mexico. I don't know where. What, what part of Mexico, Beto? Tabasco. Tabasco, uh, in the far south. So he's been here in Vermont for the last four years. He was arrested by ICE this past December. Some of you may have read about it. Um, and he spent months in immigration detention center, which he may tell you about. He was finally released, and he was granted asylum. So yeah, it's a great victory for him. <laughs> so he's a leader in the migrant justice community and, and also in the L LGBTQ community. Okay, Pero and Will. Bueno, pues gracias por por todas las personas que están aquí. Gracias y feliz día de primero de mayo. Thanks everybody for being here and happy May Day. Mi nombre es Cruz Alberto Sánchez Pérez. Todos me conocen por Beto. Y yo llegué aquí a Vermont en el 2015, el 20 de marzo. So, my name is Cruz Alberto Sánchez Pérez. Everybody knows me as Beto. Uh, and I came to Vermont in 2015, uh, in March 20th. Yo llegué como llegamos todos los emigrantes caminando por el desierto. Y llegué a tres días de camino largo a San Antonio. So I, I came, like all, all other immigrants I know, uh, walking through the desert. I walked for three long days until I got to San Antonio, Texas. Llegué aquí a Vermont por familiares y amigos y estaba recomendado para trabajar en un rancho de lechería. Uh, and I came to Vermont because I had family members and friends here, uh, and they recommended that I work on a dairy farm here. Muchos, muchas de las personas que emigramos aquí a Estados Unidos es, bueno, en mi experiencia es cuando todos decimos que llegamos a Estados Unidos porque es la, el país de la segunda oportunidad para nosotros. And so those of us who emigrate uh, and come to the United States, we, we come with this idea that the U.S. is the country of second chances, uh, of the new opportunity for us. Muchas de las personas que llegamos aquí a Estados Unidos, llegamos con distintas razones y eh, por el mismo motivo, la necesidad. Y pues en mi caso yo llegué pidiendo asilo político. So all of us who come to the United States come for distinct reasons, but with the same basic motivation, which is out of necessity. 
In my case, I came seeking political asylum. En el 2016 metí una aplicación para asilo político gracias a la organización que me ha apoyado de justicia migrante. And so in 2016, I put in my application for political asylum uh, thanks to the support of the organization Migrant Justice. Muchas de las personas que trabajan en ranchos, no en todos los ranchos, pero hay la necesidad de que muchas personas no tienen un buen hogar, una buena casa, y muchos de los de los que trabajamos en ranchos, algunos no tienen comodidades, sino donde está el rancho y están las vacas, ahí tienen la casa. And so when we get here, those of us who work on the farms, uh, we usually uh, live on the farms, and, and many of us don't have uh, good accommodations or, or good housing. Uh, some of us even live in, in the same buildings along, uh, along with or next to the cows. <coughs> Nadie tiene la oportunidad de hablar, de pedir por el miedo a un patrón para decirles eh, necesitamos un día de descanso, no muchas horas de trabajo. Nadie puede alzar la voz por el miedo a que te corra el patrón y, por ejemplo, a muchas personas están aislados en los ranchos por el miedo a migración. And so nobody feels free to be able to speak up and, and ask for the things that we need, to ask for a day off or ask not to work so many hours because you're scared that if you speak out, uh, you'll, you'll be fired or you'll be run off the farm. Uh, and because we, if we live where we work, we feel uh, very isolated. La mayoría de las personas no tienen, de todos los que emigramos, no tenemos vida social, solo de el trabajo a la casa, del trabajo a la tienda, en tu día de descanso. And then those of us who are immigrant workers, we don't have a, a social life outside of work. It's just from work to your housing, uh, back to work, and then if you have a day off, then you use that to go to the store. Y por eso existe justicia migrante. Eh, todo empezó la organización que se empezó a formar, a fundar por emigrantes agrícolas eh, desde la muerte de un compañero de, de México, de Chiapas, del nombre José Obed. Él tuvo un accidente en su trabajo y murió. And that's why Migrant Justice exists. So Migrant Justice was formed and uh, founded by uh, farm workers. Uh, in, in Vermont, and, and the organization was founded after the death of a young dairy worker named Jose Obet, who died in a work accident. Y así como todas las personas, todos los que trabajamos en ranchos, entonces se empezaron a reunir, a hacer asambleas, y para buscar una buena solución. And so those of us who live and work on the farm started to come together to meet in community assemblies uh, to try to find solutions to our problems. Eh, así como también se hacen campañas, y muchas de las campañas han tenido éxito. Eh, por ejemplo, en la campaña de la licencia, porque antes eh, si un policía te paraba, tenía mucho problema uno, Entonces, ahora está la oportunidad de que todos podemos tener una licencia. And so, through that, we have waged campaigns. And a lot of these campaigns have, have had great success. So, one early success was the driver's license campaign. Uh, before this, if you were driving and got pulled over by the police, you had a lot of problems if you didn't have a license. But we had success so that now we can get driver's licenses. Así como también se ganó la campaña de leche con dignidad y también se ganó la, en la campaña de para el polimigra, no al polimigra. And then we've also won campaigns for milk with dignity and campaigns against the collaboration between police and immigration, or what we call the polimigra. Siento un poco nervioso, esta es como que una de mis pocas veces. Estoy un poco nervioso, es una de las pocas veces que he hablado en público.
compartir algo. Yo eh, ahora me siento emocionado y pues siento que estoy feliz, feliz porque ahora tengo un asilo. So I want to share a little something. Right now I feel really excited and, and happy because I've been granted asylum. Gracias a todas las personas que compartieron mi petición y recibí más de mil cartas de aquí de Vermont. Uh, and naturally, thanks to people who uh, shared the petition uh, for my case, and that generated over a thousand letters of support from people here in Vermont. También quería compartir yo tardé tres meses en la cárcel peleando mi caso de asilo político. And for that to happen, I spent three months uh, behind bars in, in jail uh, while I fought for my asylum case. Eh, fueron tres meses duros para mí, eh, ya que me tocaba eh, estar solo y muchas personas que jamás esperé me apoyaron. Y pues, esa es la primera vez que puedo dar gracias así donde están todos en público. These were three really difficult months for me because I was alone, uh, but at the same time, a lot of people uh, showed their support for me, and, and this is the first opportunity I've had to be able to publicly give my thanks. Es también algo muy importante que justicia migrante para hacer campañas cuando hay una persona así como yo que está arrestado para ver su movimiento de la liberación. And this is something important that migrant justice does to wage campaigns uh, when people like me are detained uh, to, to fight for their, their freedom. So I want to thank all of you here who have been in solidarity with us. Es un país aquí donde no se carece de comida, donde hay buena posición, pero en la cárcel son muchas personas en un cuarto más chico que aquí, más de 45 personas. Uh, and my experience in jail was, was very difficult. Uh, it would be hard for me to say that I had a good day while I was behind bars. Um, uh, this is a country that has a lot of abundance, uh, that has plenty of food. Uh, but not in, inside. Uh, there were more than 45 of us who were being held in a room smaller than what we're in now. Yo llegué aquí pidiendo asilo por mucha discriminación en mi país y persecución, el temor, el miedo a muchas cosas. Y creo que en la cárcel aún sigue, sigue la discriminación. And I came uh, to this country looking for asylum because of discrimination I faced uh, and persecution that I faced in my own country. Uh, and then when I was uh, in jail, I found that same discrimination. So I'm very thankful and thank you for listening to me. Mexican border and the people that spoke earlier were all of I, I thought you were saying all of those people were um, applicants for uh, asylum is that right all the people coming through yes and so what happens to those <coughs> applications I mean they're only in detention for a couple of days it sounds like yeah um, <laughs> they were each given paperwork I mean we only we don't know exactly the best answers but we're, you know they were all given paperwork that told them um, a date that they would have to report back to um, meet some kind of judge. And then, you know, from there, who knows? Um, but it was, it was within a three month window. But I, my sense was that they had to check in 
but then you know there there would be you know another date given and then another date given. Um, one of the problems has been that um, people sometimes um, think that they have to report back to El Paso, so they might be in New York um, unless they've asked a lawyer to change the locale. Um, then they do have to go back to El Paso. But if you know if they have the wherewithal, if the sponsor has the wherewithal, they can get the um, the next court hearing actually in the city where they are. Um, and as far as I know, um, if you have a lawyer, you have about a 60% chance of um, being granted asylum, at least at one point um, when I read an article. But if you don't have legal representation, your chance is almost negligible. Um, so that's a problem. I just want to add to that. that I, my understanding is that places like Annunciation House only take in people who have officially presented themselves to Border Patrol and who, have, who are going through a formal sort of sanctioned process, right, through our immigration authorities. Um, and that they have to have a sponsor as well. So the whole ankle bracelet. Um, so anyone who might have crossed not through an official, you know, um, border entry um, and is outside of the system isn't going to end up at Annunciation House. Um, I, I also just want to give a little plug that there's a group of, of uh, folks in Vermont, mostly Chittenden County in central Vermont, who have been working on, um, over the last year, on sanctuary issues and are organizing a workshop for probably June 16th to look more at how we can support accompaniment of people seeking asylum, which will be hosted here at the Unitarian Church. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question about the sponsors. Who are the sponsors of these people? Family members, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Or friends. In other words, if any of you wanted to do that, then we could get that information to the Annunciation House and get help. Churches. And just to add to that, um, this is a, a change in policy that we've seen under the Trump administration that, uh, uh, of course, for many people who are entering the country, the family members who would sponsor them uh, would, would be undocumented themselves. Um, and there was sort of a, a, a policy uh, to, to keep those systems separate, uh, but under the Trump administration, there have been many arrests of sponsors. Um, so there's a real chilling effect happening where family members now who are stepping up to sponsor uh, folks who are coming and asking for asylum are being put at risk themselves. And, and that's a change that we've seen really just in the past six months. Yes, sir? Do, uh, you, you had such good relationships with people that I wondered whether some of them knew that they could stay in touch with you in any way without endangering their safety. So I wondered whether any of them, you know, that your hearts went out to, could contact you and tell you how they're doing. It was very clear um, to the volunteers that we were not to go there, not ask their stories, and uh, not take pictures, and not become that involved. So no. Yes? I noticed on the church calendar for Friday night that there's a no more deaths a film screening. Um, and so that might be something that might interest a lot of people in the, because that's obviously a, a border issue. Can you tell me more about that? Here. People don't know about that? Uh, yeah, thank you for that. So on Friday, we are in solidarity with the organization No More Deaths. They work in Arizona, and they are uh, having a call of action. So here in Montpelier, it's the art walk. So you want to look at uh, beautiful art. We're going to have art talking about the people that cross the border and disappear, and they don't make it. And we're going to be from the state house through this street uh, with special art. And then we'll come to the church and we'll show this movie called And the Terror, which is about the story of this organization that is uh, helping people um, and also shows uh, about the disappearance of people too. 
and later we're going to have a discussion. So please come because we want to tell you that now the, all these things that are coming up that happen in the south border are starting to happen in the northern border here in Vermont. It's not in the news yet, but we have to get ready and not allow this to happen. What time? Uh, so it starts at 4.30, but it's going to go from 4.30 to five, uh, to 6 that we're going to walk. And, and 6.30, the movie's going to be shown at 6.30 here. Yes, this question's for Pam. You mentioned, and I, I might get the number wrong, but 16,000 federal soldiers have been deployed to the border. Is that? No, there were 4,000 National Guard troops. 4,000. 16,000 Border Patrol agents are currently on the border. Okay, thank you for that's clarifying. The difference, right? And that's the entire border, not just Texas. I believe so. Yeah, so you can see the strain, the strain on the, the Border Patrol, right, to to contain, you know, illegal immigrants um, is it, tremendous with so many people trying to come, trying, trying to cross illegally. I guess 16,000 sounds like a lot to me, but apparently it's, it's a long border. It's a long border. Yes. Um, I wanted to, um, to ask about the logistics of your volunteer work, um, and in particular, um, how did you manage housing and food and stuff like that? I, I was thrilled to see that your group had gone because I was trying to figure out a way to go and then um, didn't really want to go alone, didn't know how it would work, and then, and then I saw, oh, here's an entire group that went. So I'm We volunteered with um, through Annunciation House. It was actually coordinated in um, by the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, um, or the College of Social Justice, and there's an application over there. You can go for a two-week stint. Um, we had our housing at the La Quinta where we were volunteering. Um, you can either, you know, stay. We didn't expect. No, we didn't expect to actually. Um, <laughs> We had an Airbnb all lined up, but then when they sent us to Las Cruces, they said, oh, we'll provide for you. And we had our meals there as well. So room and board were free. Okay. Anyone else? I have a question. Um, I was struck by something one of you said about just in uh, when people are seeking asylum, if they have a lawyer, they're 60% more likely to be successful in that application. And in the Vermont legislature last year, we, we passed some legislation that said that defense attorneys could advise their clients on just immigration matters. But the underlying bill, as it had originally been introduced, actually would have guaranteed legal representation for anyone forcing deportation or I think even a status hearing. And I'm wondering if people who are really familiar with what's happening here locally could talk about how often deportations are coming up for people living in Vermont and how useful like really ensuring legal representation, which is a policy in, in other jurisdictions, like in New York, that has been really successful. How much should we be fighting for that here in Vermont? Uh, yeah, thank you for the, the question. So I recognize Representative Selena Colburn's here and Representative Gina as well. Um, thank you both for being here and, and for your leadership on, on that bill, which unfortunately uh, didn't, didn't go as, as far as we wanted it to at the outset. Um, it, it is incredibly important. Um, people will be surprised to hear that there is not a single attorney in the state of Vermont who will represent people in deportation proceedings when they're in custody. There's not one lawyer in Vermont who represents immigrations in deportation proceedings when they're in detention. Um, so there's a, a tremendous need uh, for legal resources, and the best way to do that would be for the state of Vermont to uh, empower and fund the Defender General's Office to be able to provide that resource. It's something that the public defenders want to do. Uh, many of them are qualified to do it, uh, but they don't have the authority or the funding to do it. Um, so uh, that's something that everybody can, uh, can and, and should be supporting. Uh, there's a tremendous need for immigration lawyers in Vermont. Uh, there are great immigration lawyers in Vermont, uh, but are just limited in, in the services that they provide. Uh, and 
um, the the need is is, is great and, and growing. Um, we we regularly have cases of people who are uh, in detention and, and who need uh, lawyers for uh, detention, uh, removal proceedings, for bail, for asylum, for for a, a number of things. Um, um, so yeah, thank you for raising that important issue. Uh, and then in, in terms of, of sort of numbers of people, it, it, it fluctuates. Um, uh, it, it's been as high in the past couple of years as, as one a week uh, uh, of people who are being arrested in Vermont and put into removal proceedings. Uh, it's a little less than that right now, um, but we're seeing more arrests of uh, people uh, on the border uh, by, by Border Patrol. Uh, those cases tend to take somewhat of a, a separate route, but also need legal resources. Clarify your answer. Uh, at first, I heard you say that no attorney in Vermont would represent, and then, then I heard you say there are qualified attorneys in Vermont, but they can't represent. So, could you explain why that is? Sure. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there, there are no uh, immigration lawyers in Vermont who represent people in deportation proceedings or in removal proceedings, uh, as they're called. Um, if they're in detention. Um, uh, and what I said is that the public defender's office or the defender general's office has attorney, have attorneys on staff uh, who are trained immigration lawyers who would be able to represent people, uh, but they don't have the authority or the funding to do so. So they're limited to represent people in, in criminal proceedings, which is a different court, different body of law. Um, so that's why the bill that was introduced uh, was so important uh, and, and hopefully in the future will be passed um, that will allow public defenders, people who work for the state of Vermont, to represent immigrants in deportation proceedings. Thank you. Yes. Asylum granted. It was other people, you know, the forty percent or the hundred percent of those who don't have attorneys. What what then happens to the people that we saw who were sent up to the north or to a friend or whatever? They become deported. Una persona cuando le deniegan el el asilo tiene que esperar 30 días para una apelación para salir con salida voluntaria. So if you're denied uh, your asylum claim, uh, you have to wait 30 days in order to be able to appeal your case uh, or sign for what's called voluntary removal uh, to be sent back to your country. Si es, si es denegada tu petición de salida voluntaria del país, tienes también 30 días para ser deportado. And then if your petition for voluntary removal is denied as well, then in another 30 days you'll be deported. I have a question for her. Um, I was under the impression that those countries in Central America were going through climate change and as a result, and drought, as a result, crop failures, and another reason to leave. Is that true? So Sally was asking me, uh, since she's under the impression that climate change is a big factor in, um, in drought and other reasons people are um, leaving. And yes, I, you know, it, I, um, I heard that a few times and, and asked about it directly once with some of the community groups um, and people did name it, you know, they said the little land that they do have or might have to grow their own food on or, you know, that because of drought, they're able to grow less and less. Um, and people, what we really saw, people being forced out of the countryside into cities, into cities where there's the gang violence and then they leave. Um, but it wasn't an issue that was at top of mind, right? That those weren't the most pressing, most urgent issue that wasn't that that people could name um although it's i think pretty evident that that is a major factor yeah. peter did you have a question is, is there a sense of how no dignity is doing in terms of improvement of life for migrant workers yeah, 
per month. Yes. We have migrant justice that has been fighting uh, grassroots organization. One thing that we have is the milk with dignity program that brings corporations to pay a better price for the milk. We know that the dairy industry is suffering incredible. Farmers are not making what they need to make, which is creating more pressure to the workers so they cannot pay a minimum wage, they cannot improve the housing, they cannot give good schedules or days off. We hear that the farmers are struggling too, but also that brings more like mistreatment or worse conditions in the farms. So with the Melbourne Energy Program, what we do is, uh, in this case, we have Ben & Jerry's, the first uh, company that signed. Uh, they are paying uh, money to the farmers that's gonna be used to comply with better like living conditions and working conditions. So wages are gonna go up to the minimum state uh, wage that that's not like, if, if you know the law, agricultural workers are exempt for getting like a state minimum wage. So if they are under the program, they are gonna get that. And then there are plans for improving the housing and there are plans for maybe getting a day off, depending on the needs of the worker. There's a whole code of conduct with different things that are under the law and beyond the law. So this program is bringing this kind of change in dignified living conditions and working conditions. We're looking to expand this because we only have Ben & Jerry's for now. It's been a year since the program has happened and we see the difference. When we receive a call from a, a farm that's under the program, there is a group of investigators that can solve that. They are independent of migrant justice. They talk between farmers and workers, so they are the bridge. Um, when we receive a call that is not under the program, we can have different options. We can go and talk to the farmer, but we cannot enforce anything. Uh, and they can say we don't have the money. We can go to the Department of Labor and ask for uh, wages, like theft if happened, or wages uh, that uh, are uh, delayed. Uh, but the Department of Labor is only gonna send a letter twice. There are no investigators that go. It's difficult to enforce these things. So that's why we believe in the Melbourne Energy Program. That's a solution that the work is created. And it's not waiting for new laws, or it's not waiting for the government. It's just bringing economic justice for who's making the profit and really paying a better price for the milk. I just wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight. I know all of us as members of the audience are in deep support of all of the organizations. And at the same time, I just wanted to expand the focus a tiny bit and remind ourselves that here in Vermont, there's an extraordinary problem that we're all struggling with, and that is we have our own migrant community, our own folks who are becoming invisibilized, homeless folks. In, in here in Montpelier and all across the state, there's hundreds and hundreds of folks who don't have jobs, who don't have homes, and are in need of great support. So as we support migrant justice and all of the great work that the UU Church is doing, let's also remember we also have folks here in Vermont that need our time and attention. So tonight's program is a fundraiser for Annunciation House and for the Honduran Human Rights um, Speakers uh, Tour. Um, so I invite you all to um, look at the literature on the tables, which um, can give you an idea of things that you can do to get involved and to um, actively um, help. Um, there's a sign-up sheet if you want more information about the Central Vermont um, Refugee Action Network, and um, there are refreshments. So please help yourself. Yeah. So any money that you provide uh, to go to the Annunciation House, uh, we can unequivocally say it will go directly to Ruben Garcia, and it will go directly <laughs> to the frontline sites. There's no administration cost. There's no volunteer in, in the Annunciation Network of Charity that gets paid, including Ruben Garcia. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you.